Hello everyone, uh, welcome to um, Microscope Club. Um, we used to run these uh, events as a live session at Rutland Water, but we're trying to do things online. Um, uh, when we did this a month ago, we talked about the importance of lighting uh, in microscopy. Um, and then we asked what people were interested in at the end of the session. And a lot of people were interested in taking photographs um, and so that's what we're going to try and focus on today. So I'm going to do um, uh, an introduction uh, and then I'm going to hand over to Paul Palmer, who's going to pick up on some of the uh, things that I say, hopefully. And Paul is going to do the uh, death defying um, uh, stunt of attempting some live demonstrations. Uh, so we've all got uh, fingers and everything else crossed and uh, we hope that uh, that works. So um, I use a number of different microscopes. This is my compound microscope. This is an Apex practitioner. It's a cheap microscope. It's, um, it, it's a conventional microscope in that the light source is either under the stage and shines through the subject, or, or more usefully for entomology, you can light it from above the stage so that the light is reflected by the subject. Now we talked about lighting before, um, but um, so we're not going to go into that in detail today, but then the light is connected by the objective and it goes up and out of the eyepiece. So if you're interested in taking a photograph, you've got to um, basically put whatever device you want to use to take your photograph uh, against the eyepiece in uh, some way. Now there are some basic uh, physical problems with uh, microscopy and um, they're mostly caused by the magnification of the image. Um, the more the image is magnified, the greater vibration and movement become issues, become problems. So ideally you want your camera, well firstly you want your microscope still. Uh, microscopes and suspended floors don't go well together. Um, if you have a, a concrete, um, a, a room in your house with a concrete floor or a solid floor, a stone floor, that's probably a better location for your micro microscope than a suspended floor. I'm, uh, I, the room I'm, uh, I use uh, has a concrete floor, but it's at the front of my house and it's on a bus route. So it's okay until a bus goes by outside and I do get some vibration and it is noticeable, uh, particularly when you're trying to take photographs. So if I hear a bus coming, I have to pause and wait for it to stop. Um, breathing is something else you need to be careful about. Try not to breathe while you're taking photographs. Now this, this all seems like extreme stuff and, and of course it is a bit. But um, nevertheless, uh, vibration is, is really the major issue that we are trying to face. And one of the ways around this problem is to try and clamp your uh, device securely to the microscope. Uh, you can just hold something uh, against the eyepiece, but if you can clamp it securely to the eyepiece, you will get better results. So something that I know a lot of people are interested in is using mobile phones. And you, you can certainly take reasonable photographs down a microscope with a mobile phone. It, it's not the camera, it's not the, the detector part, the sensor part of the mobile phone that's an issue here. Um, it's more the lens, it's the field of view that you tend to get, which tends to give you this appearance uh, with, with, with a circle in the middle and then, uh, and then the outside cut off, unless you start zooming in. But since most mobile phones still use digital zooms, uh, then that just degrades the image. So that doesn't work too well. Now you can handhold the mobile phone against the eyepiece, but the problem with doing that is you're probably going to be trying to use the focus knob with one hand and holding the, the mobile phone steady with the other hand. And it's really very difficult. So there, there are all sorts of adapters that you can buy for different models of mobile phones. And I know Paul's going to talk about that a bit later, pick up on that. So that's all I will say. So I will say if you do want to use a mobile phone, you certainly can, uh, but there are some issues. 
Um, the next stage up for this is a compact camera. So this is my little uh, Lumix TZ60. So I bought this second hand a year ago for about 90 quid. Very good camera. I slip it in my pocket when I'm out in the field. Um, it, it, it does take um, uh, uh, reasonable photographs given enough light. Um, one issue is this camera does not have a filter thread. Now again, there are sort there are various devices that you can make or that you can buy if you look around to attach cameras of this sort to uh, microscopes. Um, but I've also seen all sorts of Heath Robinson devices involving plastic pipe and duct tape and lots of lots of different Heath Robinson type. Uh, you know, toilet roll insides and all kinds of things that people use to attach cameras. Uh, because if you can, if you can attach the camera hand free, you'll get far less vibration, and you'll also have your hands free to work the microscope, work the focus knob, for example. So that's helpful. But um, certainly, you can just hold the camera or the mobile phone against the eyepiece and take reasonable photographs. So here are some examples taken with my TZ60. Uh, this is a spider. Uh, and by uh, zooming in a little bit, you can see the, the epigyne uh, of this spider. And you can make out this is, this is Clubiona reclusa. And this is fairly conclusive evidence. And that's just taken hand holding um, uh, this uh, um, compact camera against a microscope. So you can do it. I think what you have to realize if you go down this route is the proportion of keepers, as photographers call them. In other words, the number of good images uh, may be quite low. Whereas if you if you can attach your camera rigidly to the microscope, uh, you'll make your life much easier and, and your photographs will be much more reliable. So here's another photograph. This is Philodromus dispar. Um, uh, I think this is a, a small focus stack. I'm going to talk about focus stacking shortly. I think this is probably a two or three image focus stack. Uh, it's a live spider, does rely on the spider cooperating and keeping uh, still. Uh, obviously, if you're working with a prepared specimen, it's not an issue. But if you're working with live specimens, um, if you want to do focus stacking, they have to stay still. So that's another constraint to think about. But compact camera, pretty reasonable picture, uh, no complaints as far as this is concerned. You can see here the field of view. The, the camera is cutting off some of the edges of the field of view. And again, this is the epigyne of that spider. Um, not, not the best uh, photograph I've ever taken, but, but good enough for identification purposes. If you're trying to, so what, I, what I'm trying to say is, if this is a, I don't know, if this is a, a, a seven or eight millimeter long spider, the epigyne is about here on the abdomen, uh, and this is a magnification of that. So, you know, you can take quite reasonable photographs, but as you can see here, the quad, we're starting to push the optics of the system uh, the the camera starting to the, the 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 quality of the image is starting to go. Uh, this this camera one of the problems with this camera is it doesn't do as well in low light situations as other cameras do. Uh, so the next step up is um, the um, uh, is is a, a little mirrorless camera a little uh, Sony uh, A6000 that I use quite a lot and I tend to use this one on my, uh, um, on my um, uh, compound microscope. And I think if you look over my, over my shoulder, over my left shoulder, you can actually see this on the microscope. I tend to leave it attached to the microscope. This camera has a filter thread and I just bought this adapter quite cheaply on eBay and you can attach it to the eyepiece of the microscope. It's a universal adapter with three uh, threads and it just uh, allows you to clamp the camera to the microscope. And that has the advantages then that you can be hands off on the camera, have your hands on the microscope, be controlling the microscope. And it, and it does make life uh, much easier, particularly when it comes to taking sets of images for focus stacking. So this is a slightly better camera than the Panasonic, but, but also it's now rigidly attached to the microscope, which is really the big step forward. Um, 
Probably most of my microscopy is done with uh, a, a binocular microscope, a stereo microscope. And while you can uh, hold uh, the camera to one of the eyepieces of a stereo microscope, uh, the next step up is, is a trinocular microscope. And this type of instrument has a beam splitter in it, so the light comes through, be it reflected light from the specimen or transmitted light. It's collected here uh, by the objective, and then it shines through. And, and in here, the light is split. Some of it comes out through the eyepieces, but some of it goes up this uh, tube as well. And, and this trinocular attachment allows you to attach a camera to it. Now, this gets very technical very quickly. You actually need some optics inside this tube. You need a replacement for the eyepiece inside this tube. This isn't simply clamping a camera on the end of here. You need an adapter which is suitable for your camera and you need uh, uh, some sort of optics in here to focus the light onto the sensor or the film in your camera if you're still using a film camera. Um, and um, so this is this is black magic as far as I'm concerned and I think both Paul and I would tell you there's a certain amount of trial and error and it, it is useful here to work with a good microscope supplier and we did discuss some firms uh, who supply microscopes in in the last uh, meeting um, and they will certainly help you get your microscope set up for your camera because it's not always entirely straightforward but when you are able to get that set up, then you will be able to take better photographs. I think the most important rule of all um, is hands off. Um, what you don't want to be doing is pressing the shutter button on the top of the camera. And this is, of course, why, why mobile phones are, such an, uh, are a bit of an issue, because you have to be touching the phone and that will almost inevitably cause vibration, which will cause problems with the sharpness of the images. Now, there is a bit of a workaround that you can use, and that is uh, most cameras have a self timer and many will have something like a two second self timer. So you can press the shutter button and, and, then, and then take your hands away and it will take an image in two seconds. But actually a far better solution is to use a wireless remote controller. So this is my little wireless remote controller that I use. Uh, this cost me a fiver. On eBay, it's a little infrared remote controller. I can be complete, I, I, I adjust the focus, I'm completely hands off. I give it a second or so for any vibration to die down uh, in the microscope. And then I press the button on the remote and take my image. And uh, again, uh, that, that reduces movement, it reduces vibration and it helps a lot. So um, again, that this usually isn't an option if you're using a compact camera, uh, but this is a way of improving the quality of the images. Now, the next uh, place where physics is your enemy rather than your friend, again, brings us back to magnification. Um, it's a simple property of optics that the more you magnify something, the shallower the depth of field gets. And even for uh, small objects like small insects, and even for parts of insects, at, magn at reasonable magnifications, you can't get the whole thing in focus at once. So if we, we may be reaching the point now where people are starting to think, okay, this is going beyond the level of detail that I want to get into, but that's okay. Um, you don't have to do this. This is, this is just the next stage in the uh, process. Um, the way you get around, you, you, if, if, you, if you don't want to do this, you just put your camera against the eyepiece or whatever it may be, get what you think is the crucial part of the insect for identification or the plant or whatever it is you're taking a photograph. So if you want to photograph spores or you want to photograph uh, the, 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 the genitalia of a moth, get the crucial bit in focus and take your picture. But even then, you won't be able to get the whole thing in focus. There will be areas of your photographs which are out of focus. 
So the way around this is a method called focus stacking and Paul's going to talk about this and hopefully do this, this live wire performance where <laughs> he shows us a live demonstration, we hope. Um, so um, there, are, there, are, um, there, there are various ways you can do focus stacking, you can do it in uh, Photoshop, you can do it in uh, other tools, but there are a couple of specialist pieces of software out there that many people use. One is called Helicon Focus, and this is a picture of what Helicon Focus looks like. The other is called Zareen Stacker. Um, I tend to use Zareen. Paul tends to use Helicon Focus. They both work in the same way. Basically, you take a whole series of images, adjusting the focus very, very slightly between each uh, image so that you rack up through the subject and, and get images planes of focus and then you use the software to uh, 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 composite them into a single in focus image so i think you can just about see that here if you look at the hind uh, foot of this uh, bug nymph you can see in this so this is one image this is this image here from uh, this stack if you look here, you can see that the foot is out of focus, other parts of the image are in focus. And then in the whole stack, when uh, Helicon has done its magic, you can see that that foot is in focus. And, and likewise uh, on Zareen. So I did a quick comparison of these recently uh, to try and see what the differences are. And uh, here's my uh, result. Here's a spider. I fed the same set of images into Helicon Focus and uh, I, I, I fed the same set into Zareen and made two focus stacks and asked the question, which one is best? And I can tell you that, well, you pay your money and you take your choice, actually. They're both very similar. They both work. They both have their dedicatees. Is that a word? You know what I mean. Uh, disciples, that's the word. Um, if, if you look online, there are lots of reviews of Helicon versus Zareen, and they all say much the same thing. They all say, if anything, Zareen is marginally sharper than Helicon, but the difference is absolutely infinitesimal. Um, the big difference is that Helicon is faster than Zareen. In, when, I, um, when I did my test with about a stack of about 20 images, Helicon was nearly five times as fast as Zareen. Zareen was taking about three or four minutes to do uh, this focus stack and uh, Helicon did it in 40 seconds. So it's much faster, possibly not quite as sharp, but for most people you're just not going to see the image. Okay. So we're going, we're going up to the next level now. Um, the next thing to mention is post-processing. Um, inherently, the images that come out of microscopes tend to be rather low contrast and, and they can be a bit dim. And the reason they, 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 they can and probably should look a bit dim is if they look very bright, you're probably blasting out the highlights on the image and you're probably not capturing all the information from the specimen. So you need to be very careful about that. So you've got this dim, rather low contrast, muddy looking uh, image. And, uh, the, uh, and then uh, the vast majority of people, the images that you see in papers, for example, or mostly online, have been processed. Um, Adobe Photoshop is one of the main programs for doing this. I used Adobe Photoshop for 24 years. Uh, in the last month, I've moved over to Affinity Photo, a new set of software, a new piece of software. There, there isn't a right or a wrong. This is a question of choice. They will both do the job for you. Um, here's an example. Uh, this is a fly I found on my kitchen window a couple of days ago. Uh, this is an image, this is a single image out of the directly from the microscope. So you can see two things here. Firstly, not all parts of this image are in focus because even at this magnification, this relatively, so these are one millimeter squares, even at this relatively low magnification, uh, the, 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 the specimen has too much depth, there will be in focus. Secondly, it looks kind of muddy uh, and, and flat. And this is after I'd finished processing them. So this is a series of images stacked 
in Zareen in my case, but Helicon would have some, done the same job. And then with the contrast and brightness adjusted uh, to bring out the specimen details. So if you can count the number of bristles on this tergite, I think you're doing rather well. Whereas here, you know, the bristles here, the spines on the leg, you know, quite clearly visible. So we're, we're aiming to bring out uh, the details of the specimen for post-processing. Now this is a this is a, a kind of a controversial issue uh, because obviously you you know you can do this to extreme. The, the other reason I should say uh, that post processing is is necessary is uh, what I might call sensor hygiene. Uh, pieces of dust uh, and, and dirt on the camera sensor will give rise to a dot on the camera sensor, and you can work out how many uh, how many images I took to make this focus stack by the times the number by the number of times this dot has been reproduced in the in the focus stack and and if you look around you can see i've got uh, all sorts of bits of dirt on my camera sensor it's more or less an inevitability now these are artifacts they're not present on the original specimen this is something that i've introduced in the process of uh, taking, of making this uh, uh, focus stack, to creating this image. And so um, from, to me, it's perfectly valid to remove these sensor artifacts because they're not on the original specimen. But of course you can take it too far. You can, uh, this, is a, this is an image that uh, I, I made a month or so ago. And, and this is deliberately over-processed. I actually did this for posters. Uh, it was done as an eye-catching image. So um, uh, I, th this isn't the normal way I would present this specimen. It's, it's, it's grossly over-processed um, in, 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 in using the post-processing software. So you need to be careful, but certainly removing artifacts and, and certainly uh, improving the contrast and resolution of the image so that features can be seen more clearly, I would argue is a legitimate thing. But opinions do differ on this um, and um, you know, uh, different people uh, uh, think different things. Okay, so that's my uh, introduction. Um, and, and so the plan is I've tossed all sorts of balls up in the air and Paul is now gonna catch them uh, and he's gonna he's gonna take them forward. Uh, so over to you, Paul. I think I think maybe what we'll do is we'll 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 we'll, we'll hear what Paul has to say first, and then open it up for discussion uh, later. If that's okay with everyone. Okay, Paul. Yeah. Well, I think I'd summarise uh, like what he said uh, as as a as a real starter. That was uh, a really excellent introduction. Um, Thanks uh, very, very much. Um, if you've got the impression that it can get quite geeky going into focus stacking, you're absolutely right. The only step that uh, Alan mess missed out that I would also include is pre-processing the stack before you stack it. And there you're getting into using automated filters but this is geeky. getting really, really um, super geeky. So let's, let's go back to the start and, and something really simple um, using the mobile phone. And then I'm, I'm gonna work up to the um, focus stacking. Now to do this, I'm gonna have to tip my monitor a little bit forward so that you can see my hands. Okay, so sorry, no matter how far I put the computer away, I, I couldn't get my head and my hands in at the same time. Well, you know that, uh, as Alan said, mobile phone is, is pretty uh, limited, but you can get supplementary, uh, here we are, supplementary lenses uh, to work with the mobile phone. And that they're quite cheap, so they may actually uh, work for you. So you can clip the uh, lens on, and what you can try to do is take a photo. I'm going to just turn this round. Uh, this is a little moth I prepared earlier. This is, um, what's it? Um, yeah, Pseudotaricosa conwagana, a tiny little moth with a long name, very pretty little name. It's about um, 
uh, I don't know, 10 millimeters across. So it's a very suitable subject. So what I'm just going to try and do is hold this camera here. Well, uh, if you're using the phone as a microscope camera, it's best to rest the uh, camera, uh, the phone down on the floor. Uh, this little widget, by the way, is a thing called a, a specimen stage. And that lets you, I'm going to flick another light on actually, I've got another light over here. And that just lets you um, view the specimen at all sorts of um, angles. And what I'm just going to try and do now is uh, flick that back. Gosh, you know what, doing this live and talking all at the same time is terrible, isn't it? Right. And now I've lost my camera setting. Right, let's get back to the camera setting photo. Here we go. And what I'm going to try and do is take a suitable photo. But the, one of the things that you notice, it's really difficult getting the distances right. So you end up with really, really difficult, uh, quite horrible photos. So while this sort of technique looks great and they, when they sell them they've always got superb photos i'm not saying you can't do it i've got a few good, decent photos but it's really really difficult to do so you can buy one of these if you like but i don't think you're going to get very far with it as attractive as an idea it is so the next thing to try with your phone is a digiscoping kit Yeah, very difficult with a live specimen. Yes, okay. Yeah, uh, sorry about that, guys. That um, that little fella did uh, did volunteer in nineteen. Uh, what would be nineteen? Yeah, twenty twenty fourteen. That specimen was taken. And what a digiscoping uh, adapter um, does is um, lines up your camera specifically so it can go down your bird spotting scope. Well, you can get a little adapter which has got some, I'm going to flick this light on again, some little rubber bits inside. So it helps align the camera uh, with the eyepiece. And what I'm going to do now is you can just see the microscope here. Uh, this microscope isn't actually my favorite microscope because my one is just away at the moment. I'm waiting delivery of my new microscope um, in, a, in a week's time. So I'm having to, uh, to, to make do with um, this one, which is still a very, very nice um, microscope loaned to me by GT Vision. And again, as Alan says, lighting is so important. Here I've got a couple of these swan necks. I've got a ring light, loads and loads of light. And what I'm gonna try and do is flick this onto camera mode so there's my camera mode and you should i'm going to flick this up yeah line it up yes get the little moth in focus in here he's in focus so we're going to get this on the end i could do this when uh, nobody was looking could you just move your your Jansjo that's illuminating the microscope up a little bit, Paul? It's in front of the cat. That's the one. Great. That's the one. Yeah. Okay. You can all see now. This is so difficult doing this um, live. Uh, I've just taken a photo, and <coughs> it, it, there you go. It's halfway reasonable if you took a bit more time, and as Alan said, used a remote control you can get rid of the camera shake in there and get some really quite nice photos. So um, I agree with Alan, it's possible to get some quite nice photos um, if you uh, use this. Now, I'll tell you what, when I, before the meeting, I managed to get that photo, which is a lot nicer than the one I just showed you because I wasn't leaping about talking all the time. So the next thing that we got to do is this camera, this microscope set up, um, you can't quite see all the microscope. So it's a trinocular microscope. On this particular one, I have to switch the camera light path in and out. And I have a dedicated 
microscope camera here. Uh, and they're just as expensive as ordinary DSLRs, but they're um, perfectly matched to the microscope. Now, as this isn't my microscope, this one isn't quite matched perfectly, um, but yeah, it, 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 it works. So this is a uh, USB 3, very high quality microsco uh, microscope camera, and I can control that through the computer. I've got the lighting that I've already told you about, and this particular microscope has a zoom control as, um, uh, as well. So this, cam this microscope goes up from about, uh, it'll be about eight times to, I think this one's 50 times. And uh, very important if you're trying to do this work with a microscope, uh, this particular binocular microscope stand has both a coarse control and a fine control. And if you get into focus stacking, you really, really will need the extra option of the fine control. You can't quite get it right, I think, without the fine control. So it's usually available as an option, um, but if you want to get down into this sort of stuff, you probably need to look at that option. The good news is, is that you don't necessarily need to change your um, microscope. We're just looking at um, uh, a widget on the, uh, on the stand. This particular stand has got the swan net lights um, built in, um, uh, but not all the stands um, have, have, have that. In fact, next time we hold this meeting, I'll, I'll have separate swan necks because the microscope I bought doesn't actually fit into this stand. Now, what I'm going to do now is try and share the, um, the screen and I'm going to go in to the, uh, the camera software. And this is where we, we're going to try and do this death defying trick of making a um, focus stack live. So let me try to share this screen. And I've got so many screens open um, here. Uh, and what I'm looking for, uh, oh, I found it, okay. I found the right, um, right screen. I'm gonna pull the computer around a, a, a little bit. And what I think I've got here, let's do, yeah. So what I've got here is I've let me set the auto exposure. So I'm now this what you can see is a picture that's actually down the microscope. So if you were here with me breaking all the COVID-19 restrictions and uh, can we'd each be contaminating our eyes because I've been peering down this, um, you would see exactly this and if I ramp up the zoom control um, you notice on all these microscopes you do have to move the specimen a little bit but we can zoom right in and um, have a look at uh, details on on this moth yes yeah, so I guess flip the auto exposure again there there we go so we're actually starting to get into um, details on the, um, uh, the the wing of this um, uh, moth, which is um, which is great. Now, if we were going to try and do a focus stack properly, it's going to be a bit like watching paint dry because I would sit ever so still, take a photograph, crank it, wait a moment, take another photograph, and so forth. But life's too short to do that. So what we're going to do is I'm going to zoom back out a little bit. Whoops, that's the other way. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to crank the focus away so it's all out of focus. I'm going to click on the record uh, and I'm going to record a video. And that's going to give me a really big focus stack if I crank through the, um, the focus range. Of course, there's all sorts of reasons why you don't really want to make your top quality photos like this. First, your hand is here and everything's wobbling about. So that's the first problem. 
The second is that when you're taking a video, when it gets taken into the stacking software, it gets taken through as a JPEG. And uh, JPEGs um, have uh, is what's called a lossy format and lose a lot of information. But it will give a really quite nice demo of, um, of this technique. So what I'm going to do now is click the record. And when it starts recording, gosh, I've got the blue, uh, the spinning colored wheel here. OK, I'm recording now. So what I'm doing is carefully cranking through the exposure and trying to go quite slowly. And I'm building up um, a little video of the, the same thing. Now I'm going to stop. And it stopped. Hey, it stopped. OK, now I'm going to stop the share and I'm going to switch over to Helicon Focus. So let's see what happens now. Right. Share a screen again. Find Helicon Focus. By the way, I'm one of these people who um, my desk, my computer here is a MacBook Pro and I typically have it set up with um, nine desktops. I'm just like that and that I have no idea how well um, uh, this system would cope with me flipping between my desktop so what I'm going to do now I'm in Helicon Focus and I'm going to open a video and it's video three because I've tried it twice earlier this afternoon I'm going to open the, um, the video and it's 135 megabytes well, that might sound a lot, but it's not that big because if you do a focus stack on um, you know, DNG, absolutely raw format, probably every photo in the, uh, the video st in the stack is going to be 30 or 40 megabytes. You, you end up with enormous numbers of um, photos. Uh, let me uh, now. Hopefully you can see on the screen here. I've got a video stack. I've got 107 Im images. What I'm going to do is just ask it to check every third. And now what we'll do is uh, we've got a lot zoomed here. Oh, here we are. So this is a sort of screen. This is my area of interest. And you know what? I'm just going to press the, the render button. What it's going to try and do is take every third image. So we're going to stack um, 30 uh, images. And um, there you go. So you should see now um, the second image. It has done a reasonably good job of stacking the, that, that image. Now, if I used more images, I'd get a higher quality photo. That looks reasonable. So um, what I'm going to do is now ask it to check um, every image. So check call. Here we go. Now, the great thing on um, uh, this particular computer, Macs are really well set up for processing um, images. There's a number of different ways of rendering, but basically the method that's called pyramid rendering works really well on wildlife subjects, and particularly if all the images are in order, as they are here. So I'm going to press render um, again. And this is going to take um, a little longer, but here we're stacking 107 images to, um, together. And you can see, um, I've got a little warning there. Yeah, it, has, it hasn't worked um, as, uh, as, as well here. Um, so let's, I've no idea why. Uh, <clears throat> what will have happened, it will have, uh, as, as Alan says, when you get little blemishes and things, the software doesn't know which bits are moth and which bits are, are blemishes. And sometimes it will kind of misfire and focus on the wrong thing. So if I were to try that um, uh, again, so if I reset and um, try again and focus here, let me try this. Uh, I'm going to really focus in on the moth. You can see I can set crop areas and areas of interest. Let's um, let's try that again. See if it works better the um, uh, the second time when I've taken a bit more um, trouble. 
Now, I did say to you know, when, uh, when I was commenting on Alan's um, talk that I also um, pre process images, yes. Yeah. So, we've got a bit of a, a problem. If I try to use all the images, it doesn't seem to um, work terribly well. So, um, I also pre process images, which is quite a complicated thing to do. But if you think of it, the software, the image stacking software is dumb. It's not very clever. It, it's just very good at kind of working out what it thinks are the sharp bits and it, it extracts that from, from each picture. So what you've got to do is give it the very best um, hints that you can. And what you really need to do is make every single picture that you take as good as it can possibly be and then stack the pictures and then you will get results. So basically, if you put in rubbish photos, you can't expect it to give you brilliant photos um, coming out. So in this live demonstration, I tried to use all the images um, in the stack. It didn't work. If I used every third image, it, it, it worked very well. And it may be with um, different algorithms, I get different results. But you, um, you, you can see that it has actually joined everything together. Now, post-processing, what I would do is when I get a decent image, I'll actually take it into um, Photoshop, as Alan suggests, and I do a hell of um, a lot of um, post-processing. And if I very quickly show you the sort of thing that I do, um, I'm sh sharing another uh, program again. Yes, have a look. Oh, yeah. Okay, um, I'm now going to share a screen um, bird journal. So um, uh, this was a dissection in the middle of the screen, um, a clearis scalariana, um, <clears throat> which cannot be identified unless you dissect it. This is a, a female. Um, actually, I think we dis actually dissected this at the microscope club and I, I took it home. So um, made a permanent slide of it. So to get this particular slide, it had about three hours of processing to get to that sort of um, point. So um, I'm hoping with my new setup, it will be a lot quicker to, uh, to get to that point. But one thing I, I really don't want to, to give you the impression of is that um, stacking is quick. It's a lot of fun, but it does take a certain sort of mindset to um, uh, do it. I think up here is, yeah, there's um, uh, another dissection. The, uh, the, this one's a bit softer. Um, I, I was really at the limit of the microscope that I was uh, using there. It was, that one was taken with a, um, uh, a previous microscope. Um, this was taken with a DSLR and Nikon attached to the microscope to get the um, get the stack and I had real trouble um, getting the stack to work in the way that I wanted. Having said that though, um, getting some really nice diagnostic photos and these photos have ended up on the Moth Dissection UK website. So um, you will see some of the outputs. So stuff that came out of the microscope club. Right, I think I've prattled on enough here about um, the focus stacking and the techniques that I'm using. I'm sorry if I've made it sound, you know, uh, put, put you off by making it sound too technical, but it is a technical subject. I wouldn't want you spending your money and then getting really disappointed on the results. Um, I, I'll be honest with you, I, I found it a little bit of a money pit. Um, <laughs> I, I keep wanting to up, upgrade. And as I say, I've been working with GT Vision and um, we've, uh, we've agreed a, a new permutation of microscope for me. And I'm re um, I've actually split the microscope into two microscopes because I can't get it all in one. And I'm really, really looking forward to um, trying out the kit that they've um, uh, finally sold me. 
and in conjunction with the software that I purchase, I'm hoping that I'm going to get some really, really good photos. But if I don't, it'll be my skill that's the problem, not the not the kit that I've bought. So there you go. Um, can, I, can, I, can I just come back in briefly and say th thanks very much for that, Paul. Um, I, I think that's a very brave thing to do, uh, to make a live focus. I've never seen anyone make a focus stat live before, so well done. <laughs> But I want to pick, I want to emphasize something that you just said. Um, I, I, I don't, uh, we shouldn't be putting people off, I think. And, mm -hmm. and, and we shouldn't be encouraging people to spend a lot of money. Don't start at the top end. Yeah. So start off by holding your mobile phone or your compact camera against the eyepiece and see what you can do. And, and if it produces images of a sufficient quality for you to enable you to identify specimens then that's great and you might be happy with that and and, and that might be it if if like me and paul you're of a mindset where you think you look at it and you think oh i could do a bit better than that then then you can progress and and but you don't have to start with focus stacking focus stacking is the kind of place where you where you finish up and it's it's very much the um, and it, and it's not a, it's very much a journey rather than a, than a, than a thing that you you can buy off the shelf. Um, I, I'm, I always think of Dave Brailsford, the cycling guru, and his his doctrine doctrine of incremental improvements. So, for example, um, uh, just this week there are a couple of tiny things that I've done which have improved the quality of my image. So I've been doing this for several years now and just this week uh, just yesterday i changed one very minor setting on my camera and it's definitely made an improvement and i also learned i, I also learned a slightly different sharpening technique in affinity photo and that's an improvement because you get the same amount of sharpening with less graininess and 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 this is after several years of doing it and each tiny little thing that you learn you can add on but the thing to do is to start is to have a go is to get your camera or your mobile phone and your microscope and hold it against the eyepiece and take some images and and i think the final thing i'll say before i shut up is do however think about your lighting because without decent lighting as we discussed last time and the recording of that is available on the nature spot channel on youtube you won't be able to take decent images cameras are quite light hungry compared with your eyes and the better your lighting the better the quality of the images yeah so uh, yeah yeah you're absolutely uh right uh alan and that's one of the reasons why i started off with the mobile phone at the um the start because the end of my my talk i'm, I'm using something that's very high end um, uh, um, but I wanted to emphasize that I actually started here and I've got some great photos at, you know, using, using this kit. Um, uh, so yeah, I agree with everything that Alan, Alan said. And if you're a birder as well, it may well be that you've already got some digiscoping kit that can be adapted to uh, go with your, your microscope as, um, as well and get some good photos there um but you know at the end of the day uh, this is um i think we're all doing this as a hobby it's meant to be fun and i always think the best hobbies are things that you can constantly improve upon and to me that's the the, the great thing about you know heading into the microscope work to identify things but also then taking the photos because i'm now doing some dissection for other people actually taking the photos to record what I see and I just keep wanting to make the photos better and better. I see the sort of photographs other people have posted and think, how did they do that? Um, I, I, I want to learn more. It, but it's, you know, a sense of fun comes over. You, 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 know, you, know, you know you're in too deep when you have to start saying it's supposed to be fun. That's when <laughs> you know you're in too deep, yes. isn't it? Really? Uh, okay, so we've got some... We, we've got some comments in the chat window um, from Andrew. Yeah, I think both Doreen and Helios, uh, or sorry, Helicon, um, mm. give you a month's free trial 
Um, I think they're both limited in what you can do in terms of the output and that, but you can certainly try the software out for free for a month. So yeah, absolutely. Try before you buy, yeah. see which one you like, see, see which one uh, works for you. Um, and then Derek said, Zareen works on Linux as well as Windows and Apple. Um, d uh, Paul, do you know whether Helicon works on Linux? Uh, no, I don't think it, um, it, it does, at least when I last checked, because as many of you know that I'm a, a Linux and Mac person. Um, I do have a virtual Windows machine on here, which I use in a blue moon. Um, it is a very up-to-date version. And one thing that I would say that if you're thinking of buying some of this kit, you need to check compatibility, even with Windows. So the camera that I've got here is quite a high-end camera, but it turns out it's USB 3.1, although it says it's USB 3 on the box, it's actually USB 3.1. So it will only run on the very latest hardware. So not only do you need Windows 10, you need the latest hardware to support it. Now, as it happens on my virtual machine on here, the camera won't run properly at the moment, but I'm expecting the next update to come through because VirtualBox is like an emulator, then it will. But on the Mac, it will run perfectly. So my MacBook Pro will support it. But this is where, you know, you really, really need to talk to your microscope supplier, GT Vision or Brunel, really get good advice before you spend your money because there's a lot of little pitfalls and you could waste a lot of time chasing your tail, having spent some money on getting something that doesn't actually work. But of course, if you're um, buying secondhand, which is a great way to do that. I bought loads of secondhand stuff on eBay like um, Alan uh, has, because it, it can be a great way of trying. The older kit, you probably won't run into that sort of compatibility. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of buying all sorts of cheap bits and widgets uh, off eBay, definitely. There's, there's all sorts of adapters and, and all kinds of, of, of things available. There's a whole world of stuff out there. Okay, shall we, um, shall we open it up for questions or comments? Does anyone want to ask anything or show anything? I'd, I'd, I'd like to ask a question, Alan. Yeah. Sorry, um, it, it, it's, it's about the eyepiece. I think you mentioned about the eyepiece magnification because it, I only have a very, very low uh, specification of microscope. It's either 20 or 10, I assume. And I assume you're saying that I should use the 10, the lower one, or does it really matter? Um, it, well, it depends what you're trying to take a photograph of and how much magnification you need. I'd, I'd always advise you to use the lowest magnification you need um, uh, to, to, to visualize whatever details you're, you're trying to see. Uh, I mean, if you're trying to do something like um, a whole beetle, um, or a whole spider, you probably don't need that much magnification. Okay. And, and generally, the more the magnification goes up, the more the quality goes down. Certainly, I've, I've got 10x eyepieces and 20x eyepieces, and, and, and I know the quality of the 20x eyepieces, they're not as sharp as the 10x eyepieces. So only use the magnification that you need would, would be my advice. Mm -hmm. Can, can, so can I ask just another question about the USB one as well? Sorry, thank you very much, by the way. So it's been a really great, useful, really been great. Thank you. But the question I want to ask is about the USB one. I'm assuming then with that, it goes directly onto the computer and you can download your images and do what you need to do as you are doing. Is that what I'm making? Some, so what's the prices would those things be? Um, is Les watching, Paul? Does, do you want to tell her how much it oh, costs? Oh, well, oh. Les, Les knew all about it. So um, <laughs> you can go, you, you, this is a, um, a GX Cam um, USB 3 Pro, uh, 20 megapixel. It's over a thousand pounds just for the camera. Um, but you can buy some really, really good USB microscope, which I used to use, and I started off using that. 
Um, uh, they don't won't do everything like this, of course, but you can buy one of those for 30 or 40 quid. And I used to do all my dissections with a USB um, microscope camera, playing it on the screen of the computer. So I'd be looking up at the screen while my hands were down here. You can do it. It's so much easier with with this very expensive kit, but you can um, you you can do it. So I would say the price range um, is uh, everything from about um, you know sort of thirty or forty pound all the way up to a couple of thousand pound. Um, more more Ten, tens it, of thousands of pounds. Yeah. Oh yeah, but then then we're going into real laboratory. Um, equipment and I think very few amateurs I'm just sort of thinking of this as sort of thing that very serious amateurs um, might might go for but this is what I mean that you you can spend a lot of money and the advice is so important and you will be much happier if you do this in lots of lots of small steps rather than just dive in at the expensive end I would really even if you know you're going to end up spending a lot of money, you're better off starting, and you've never done this before, you're better off starting at the bottom and knowing that you're going to sell it again on eBay in six months time or something than diving in at the top and having a load of features that you can't use or you, you know, you're not quite sure what, what to, what to do um, with. So um, I, I hope that kind of answers your question, but yes, I've, I've got a, a USB, cable plugging into the Mac um, here and the software I was using um, effectively came with this class of um, camera and is available in for both Windows and Macs. Not Linux as far as I know. Thank you, thank you. Anybody else? Alan, can I ask you a question? Oh yeah, Bill. So I'm using the same microscope as you are, Alan, and I don't have the electronic focusing that Paul has on his more sophisticated uh, microscope. How do you do your focus stacking? Because that's not, uh, how can I say, it's not the most delicate focusing knob on the back of that no, uh, GQ no. Vision microscope. No, that's, that's true. Um, I, I mean, I, I, just, I just rack by hand through the specimen, uh, being, taking the minimum number, you know, the, the, the minimum distance with each adjustment. Uh, the important thing I've found is then to take your hand, it, it, is to be patient, um, is to take your hands off the microscope, leave everything for a couple of seconds and allow the vibration to die down. Uh, before you you press the remote because uh, every time you touch the microscope or even breathe on it um, you know you, you do get a surprising amount of movement and vibration which, which can take a second or two to, to damp down um, so that's how my images are produced um, Paul you 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 said on your stand you've got um you you've got a, a, an adapter that gives you fine focus on the, on the stand? Uh, no, uh, uh, thanks for asking. I was going to jump in there. Uh, no, Bill, my, my uh, stand is entirely mechanical. But what I hadn't realized um, until I was talking to the microscope supplier is that most of the stands for your microscope are available with um, uh, an, a fine focus option. But normally, um, if you've got your microscope set up and you're using it as um, uh, a dissecting or biological microscope, they don't always give you, you know, they, they tend to sell you the one without the fine focus. So I'm going to turn, um, uh, you won't be, I can't get too close, I'm going to knock my cup of tea over here, but the, um, I've got a... A little uh, bit more, Paul. Yeah, okay, this is what I'm just, uh, yeah, 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 so I've got an outer... Um, uh, ring and then there's a, a in, in the middle there's a fine focus ring and say it's often available as a, an optional extra but you do need to change the um, the stand now my one has got some calibration marks on them the only use of those is that when you're doing a stack and you're doing it carefully um, I can say I'm going to go five divisions five divisions five divisions and I, I pause as Alan says between each each go 
um, to really let everything settle down. I mean, at the moment, I've got a window open here for some fresh air. I'd shut the window as well because I want everything to be really still. And I also tell Leslie that I'm going to be making a stack, but really frustrating to get halfway through a stack and think, oh dear, somebody walked in. <laughs> bump the table, bought me a cup of tea, you know, <laughs> uh, sort of thing. So there you go, Billy. It's, uh, um, and what I did to get that video stack, I literally just grabbed hold of the handle, started recording and just wound down like that. It was a really, really crude, horrible, horrible thing to do. But you can see, I mean, I, I got some results like it. But um, trust me, don't, you've got to promise not to tell anybody that's how I, I actually did it. <laughs> hey, that's how, that's how I do it now. The technique. <laughs> but it's a horrible way to do it. But it conveys the, um, uh, conveys the, 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 the message. There's just so much wrong with doing it that way. Uh, any, any, any reputable microscope firm, I think, will be, and we did, we did run through a whole bunch of recommendations uh, in the last session. Uh, we'll be happy to sort of talk to you about this. And, and generally speaking, the companies are, are, are really happy to talk about this because they figure out nine times out of 10, you're going to wind up spending money at the end of the conversation. So they're always really happy to give you advice. So, yeah. They're, they're, um... So just one more question. Um, you know um, what it is that I'm photographing. So Paul's fine with his static moth pinned to at least a little piece of foam. And yeah, it's going to vibrate. But when you put uh, spiders, which is essentially what I'm doing, into alcohol, um, just the thermal properties uh, of your lighting causes that to convect the, the specimen to move. How tolerant are these uh, focus stacking software of slight movements in the specimen that we simply can't control? They're, they're, they're pretty good at alignment. Uh, Paul, when Paul showed, so there, there are different methods, different algorithms uh, for alignment. Um, there are um, uh, two in, uh, or, or, well, there are two main ones in Zareen, but you can do a combination. Um, and, and there are three sort of baked into Helicon. Um, they, they do make adjustments if, for slight movements um, in, in the specimen. Uh, if you get a big movement, uh, it, will, it will screw up the stack. You can always uh, eliminate particular frames from a stack. If you've got one or two frames in a stack that aren't quite as sharp as the others, sometimes it's a good idea to drop those frames and then you'll get a better result overall. Um, but the, the software is pretty good at lining up those small, I mean if your specimen is bouncing around so much that the software can't line it up, then, then, then there are, I think there are, there are other problems. So my, my specimens are mostly alcohol preserved and they're in, uh, I use a, a well with glass beads to hold the specimen still uh, and submerse it in alcohol. And mm -hmm. there aren't too many movements with, um, uh, uh, with there aren't too many problems with movement. Uh, uh, also these days, uh, pretty much gone over to LED lighting. So heat isn't so much of a problem. I think if you're using sort of halide bulbs or the old tungsten bulbs, yeah, yeah they could heat your specimen up. Um, uh, the, uh, well, actually, I, I did have a problem a couple of weeks ago when we had that really hot weather um, that I, the, the bloody alcohol in the well was evaporating so that by the time I got to the specimen, the specimen was poking out of the alcohol. <laughs> That's how hot it was in my study, which was really annoying. Um, but um, the, the software is pretty good at lining things up. Yeah, uh, I'd like to chip in on Helicon Focus. Um, you, in your settings, you can actually um, manage the tolerance of shifting between images as uh, well. Of course, the, uh, the more tolerance you put in, the slower it makes the, um, the stack, the stacking. Um, and the, uh, the final thing, I mean, in Helicon itself, I don't know about Zareen, um, uh, if there's been, say, a movement of one particular limb, you, you can actually manually yeah. pick out bits from um, uh, a photo. So, you know, uh, even at the stacking stage, you, you can do some yeah. post-editing of the photo. But what I would say is that, you, you know, the, um, the, the drifting between photos is, um, is manageable in um, Helicon. 
but the price that you pay is increased stacking time. And if you um, are expecting quite a few problems like that, then things like the pyramid stacking, which was the one that I, I used my demonstration, that is the most tolerant of big stacks and movement. But as Alan says, I mean, this is where you're starting to get in. You need to just experiment and see what, what works for you. Yeah, um, both, both, both Serene and um, Helicon allow you to paint out any, air, any frames where there's been movement. Um, uh, you, you can do that. So I would, I, I mean, this is, this is getting beyond microscopy now, but the, I, I tend to use the DMAX algorithm in um, uh, um, uh, Zareen where for specimens taken with a camera, um, which are more sort of the sort of the things that you'd normally expect to see from, you know, photographs just taken in the field. And, but PMAX works better for microscope stacks generally that are lower contrast. But it, it's really a question of getting in there, playing around. And both Helicon and Zarine have lots and lots of videos online showing mm. you how to do this and explaining in enormous detail the difference between all the algorithms and, and, all, and all the rest of it. So, yeah. Thank you. Any more questions? Okay. Well, I don't want to monopolize, Alan, but go, if no go, one go, else yeah, is asking. On. Yes. Um, we've got two advocates here. I, you haven't mentioned the differences in price between Helicon Focus and Zarine. Are they equitably priced or? So Helicon is slightly more expensive, um, uh, um, but um, if, you, if you look them up, you, you'll see their pricing. Helicon's a little bit more expensive. There isn't a huge amount in it. Um, so it, it's, the, the, there's not a great deal of difference. The, what you buy with Helicon, in my opinion, is time. It is faster uh, mm -hmm. than Zarine. Although whether, it, I think it's to do with um, Zarine not addressing uh, multi-core processors as well as Helicon seems to be able to do that. Um, there is rumor that Zarine might cope with that in a future update. But um, you know, we we wait and see. Uh, as I say, my 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 finding and, and and the finding of a lot of the online reviews is that Zarine tends to produce a slightly sharper result, but it is slower to do so. There's, there's nothing to choose between them really. I, I would, uh, if you've not used either of them before, uh, get the free trial, try them both out, see which one you like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one other thing just to chip in. I, I've got no experience of using Zarine. But if you're a Nikon or Canon user and you have macro lenses, then you can control the camera and the focusing directly on the macro lens. So I've got, um, I sometimes set up, um, uh, I'm not going to get it out now, but a, a, a big tripod where I can set it up with um, you know, vertical racking and the camera on that. And I will put the macro lens with a ring flash on there and then I will drive the camera directly from the software and build up um, an image stack. So I'd say, say set up a 30, 40 image stack and then I'll leave the room and let the, uh, um, the software drive the lens to build up the stack. Um, but that's really macro rather than micro photography. But you can get some amazing depth of field images doing that. They say it's, it's, it's off topic, but I say I don't know what the particular compatibility is of Zarine, but if you're a Nikon or a Canon user, you might just also want to check out that capability as well to see if it fits in with the sort of things that you enjoy doing. It, it, it's a question of starting, I think, and trial and error and, and, and seeing what you like, really. Mm. Okay, so we, we seem to be running low on the questions. So um, what I'll do is I'll just stop the recording now and thank everyone for coming this afternoon. What I, I really, really hope we haven't put anyone off. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and just finish, I think, by saying, just, just have a go. Just get your camera or your phone, hold it over the lens, take a photo, 
and then you know and then if you're not happy just experiment and 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 take it a bit further but but do you know do have a go at taking photos down your microscope don't forget the lighting that's the main thing so so thanks everyone thank you